Randy, you think we're about ready to start? Excuse me, if I may. I think we're about ready to get going. Um, I think we want to keep on track. We have a group photo after this. And uh, Blaine, did you, where did he go? If you had some announcements. I guess not. So I had a uh, I had a wonderful presentation prepared for today, and forgot it at the house. Yeah. But um, if you spend enough time paying attention to people and how people are acting, you'll come across all the information you'll ever need to build a successful life. Today, I want to start talking about image. I want to talk about our image. I want to talk about your image. And I'm going to challenge some preconceived notions. And they really need to be challenged. A couple of days ago, I had the, I had the opportunity to have a discussion with a young man. And I said, where do you picture yourself in five years? I want you to take that very seriously. When I say, where do you picture yourself in five years? What are you going to look like? His response was, well, I'll have a get together and I'll have all these people and they'll all think well of me because I've done this good thing or I've done that good thing. He has committed himself, without even knowing why, to a walk-on role in other people's lives and their approval. So what kind of image do you want to have in five years? Is it one based upon the ideas that someone else holds to be true? What's that image of you look like? What do you look like? Are you fit and tall and strong? Are you a proud representative of your name, your ancestors, of who you could become? Or are you sitting there simply waiting on someone else to say, yes, you're good enough? Because that is the predominant thought process amongst most people who are searching for spirituality, who are searching for love, who are searching for financial security. Yes, you're good enough, here's a paycheck. Yes, you're pretty enough, let's, be a, let's have a relationship. Yes, you're spiritual enough because you've read this, that, or the other, and now we deem you to know your spirituality. All of it contingent, your image, your well-being, your perception of yourself, contingent upon someone else. And so when he told me that, I said, no. What do you look like? What do you want to look like in five years' time? How are you going to make the decision about what that should look like? By reading something? By reading what someone else wrote? By reading something I wrote? Are you going to wait on how well you fit yourself into something that I've written to determine the quality of who you're going to become? What if I don't know enough to express sufficiently how great an individual you might truly be? Because that's a legitimate re a deal. Hi. So let's start with questioning this writing. And I'm going to read to you from the Greeks. And we're going to go from the Greeks to the Egyptians, to ideas about Aryans, and then finally back here. This is between Socrates and Phaedrus. At the Egyptian city of Necrotus, there was a famous old god whose name was Thuth. The bird is which is called the ibis. It's sacred to him. And he was the inventor of many arts, such as arithmetic and calculation and geometry and astronomy and draughts and dice. Think about that. Before we had any kind of written language, we knew how to communicate with each other sufficiently to understand higher mathematics and build megalithic structures we can't build today. And yet we have writing and consider ourselves intelligent. Word of mouth, mentorships, talking to each other, kind of like we're doing here. Spreading ideas, hope, support, and I'll continue. Now, in those days, the god Thanos was the king of the whole country of Egypt, and he dwelt in that great city of Upper Egypt, which is called, which the Hellenes called the Egyptian Thebes, and the god himself was called Ammon. To him came Thuf and showed his inventions, desiring that the other Egyptians might be allowed to have the benefit of them. He enumerated them. And Thamus inquired about their several uses and praised some, some of them and censured others as he approved or disapproved of them. 
It would take a long time to repeat all that he said to Thuth in praise or blame of the various arts, but when it came to letters, this is, this is said Thuth will make the Egyptians wiser and give them better memories. It is a specific both for the memory and for the wit. Famous replied, O genius, ingenious Thuth, the parent or inventor of an art is not always the best judge of the utility or inutility of his own inventions to the users of them. And in this instance, you who are the father of letters, from a paternal love of your own children, have led to attribute to them a quality which they cannot have. For this discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in the learners' minds and their souls, because they will not use their memories. They will trust to the external written character and not remember of themselves, the folk soul. The specific which you have discovered is an aid not to memory, but to reminiscence. And you give your disciples not truth, but only the semblance of truth. They will be the bearer hearers of many things and will have learned nothing. They will appear to be omniscient and will generally know nothing. They will be tiresome company, having the show of wisdom without the reality. Better, yes, Socrates, you can easily invent tales of Egypt or any other country. Socrates said, there was a tradition in the temple of Dodona that the oaks gave first prophetic utterances. The men of old, unlike in their simplicity to young philosophy, deemed that if they heard the truth from an oak or rock, it was enough for them. Whereas you seem to consider not whether a thing is or is not true, but who the speaker is and from what country the tale comes. I cannot help feeling, Phaedrus, that writing is unfortunately like painting, for the creations of the painters have the attitude of life. And yet if you ask them a question, they preserve a solemn silence. And, many, and the same may be said of speeches. You would imagine that they had intelligence, but if you want to know anything or put a question to any one of them, the speaker always gives one unvarying answer, something he's read. What are you reading right now to create the image of what you want to become? What does it look like? What are you studying to build yourself into something better? Why is it relevant? <laughs> in, in the 1920s, C. Gordon, Seabird, Seabird and Child, that, that's Seabird and Child, that's his name, he was a professor of archaeology at Edinburgh. He was convinced of the prominence of the Aryan culture, how it spread across much of Asia and India and Europe and by its predominantly successful, its strong European bloodline. It was allowed it to conquer civilizations much greater than itself. This was the school of thought. This was the PC characteristic of that day, the Aryan belief. Everything tied together because of one language. And for 70 years now, it's been taught, been told, been spread about that the Aryan idea is true. Is that what we're gonna to use to build ourselves into something better? Is that the thought process we need to lean on? Do we need to find a justification or an excuse in some old book for us to become something more? Today, there's a professor at Cam not Cambridge, Yale, who has written a tome on India and the PC culture of this day puts an absolute death knell and a complete denial of anything that has to do with an Aryan ideology. That there was in fact no great culture that connected all of these things together. That there was in fact no strong bloodline that put it all together. That's the PC idea of today. Which one should we buy into? Which one builds us into something better? Should we continue to believe and read these old writings? Should we listen to what Rudolf or Simic or anybody else or myself has written into a book in letters and not spread true wisdom or intelligence amongst the folk to build us into something by sitting down and sharing a meal, by shaking a hand, by giving a hug? This image that we want to cultivate of ourselves, the idea of immortality rests not within those old dusty tomes that so many people want to spread about on social media as being true. That's not where our future lies. Our future resides right here in this room. Our future resides in a room in South Carolina or in the Odenshof or in anywhere in the country where a group of people like us want to get together and share the ideas, cultivate friendships and rebuild a folk soul. 
Now, what's that supposed to look like in 10 years time? Are we going to continue to allow others to determine the quality of what we become because of someone else's old writings? Or are we going to build an image of what we want to be? Now, how do we build an image if we can't use those old writings? Well, what the shit are we supposed to use? <laughs> we have some gift, some sense of reliability. About a thousand years ago, 2000, 1000 years ago, a presiding judge of the all thing put some of these ideas in words. We call it the poetic and the prosetic. And in that outline, we find these recurring gifts from the gods. From Odin, Vili, and Ve, who walked along the shore and found two without purpose and gave them gifts of good sense, color, direction, and purpose. That's a pretty heck, that's, that's a heck of a gift, if you ask me. Because I can walk down the street today and I can show you hundreds of homeless people walking around and shuffling along the street. Many of them look just like us that don't seem to have good sense, purpose, or direction, and they're holding up a sign saying, I need money, and they got a bachelor's degree because they know how to read and write. They're uneducated, but they have no direction. Right off the bat, I feel a tremendous sense of gratitude at what I am in a recipient of from my chosen faith, the faith that calls to me. Then we go look a little bit further, and we see that in the Rig Stula, you have Rig that walks along, and you can look at it generationally, or you can look at it as classes. It matters not, from the great-grandparents to the grandparents to the parents. It might be a thousand years between each one of these visits, but each one of them has a son, and he's presented with a wife, and they sit on the edge of the bed, and they build a tradition where they discuss what's going to happen. She shares with him a memory drop in the exact same way Sigurd Reef or Brunhilde shares with Sigurd. A memory drop and a well of understanding is opened up to the couple and they have children. Those children have names that are the foundational blocks of building a civilization, right? Stumpy Leg and you know, all these other names that this first generation has. The second generation shows skill, some skill at wood carving and that that son has a wife, and those grandchildren of that couple, well, now they're skilled craftsmen. Now they're artismen. Now they carve blocks, okay? So there's a pattern emerging here. Where do we fit in that pattern? Then you get to the parents. Now we're talking about kings. Now we're talking about individuals that learn the language of the birds, just like Sigurd did after he slayed the dragon of his life. He learned the language of the birds found his partner and opened up a well of understanding. It wasn't written, it was a shared drink. It was a sharing of emotion. It was a personal communication. It was people making that connection. Not based on what something that they've read that makes more sense than the other guys, but some very special connection of emotion that allows us to feel, I made the right decision coming in this way. I feel good about my decision to walk down the, down the street because I'm, I'm okay. When's the last time some of us have walked down the street and had that feeling that, you know what, I'm okay. I'm gonna be all right. What a fucking challenge that can be some days. When you have all of these people who will, in a heartbeat, read a word without any wisdom or understanding and use that word that's been written down to build their ego into something better so they might seem more important than you or you or you or me. Why should I listen to that? Where does that lead us? <laughs> well, so we've been given gifts. We've been given a generational identity and each generation builds something stronger and the final generation, they become rulers by their own hand. They have intelligence. They learn the language of the birds. This is not a written language. This is an understanding of the flows of the energy across the world. As animals migrate to greener pastures, so too do people graduate or, or migrate to healthier spiritual uh, scenarios. They migrate or they work for to build healthier emotional connections. And that's what we're doing here. We work out all the time. We talk about building our bodies. We talk about reading our books to build our thought process, to build the strength of our bodies. Why wouldn't we do the same kind of work to build the kind of emotional connections that we have all wanted as we wandered through this world alone? I don't know about many of you, but I've sat in a lot of rooms and felt alone. 
How do I build that? Do I read something? I get up off my ass and I go shake a hand. Because I've got a set of gifts. Now I've got another set of gifts. And it gets better. When I look at Balder, whose home in whose in whose homes were the fewest baneful rooms, and gave these excellent judgments that a man might believe in his society. His son, Porcetti, settles all of these arguments in the most favorable manner that we might all rely upon something we could believe in. Now, all of a sudden, I've got a cornerstone of a society where men might be free. What happens in a society where a free man is secure enough to express who he is? What kind of home can he build for a woman so she might express the beauty of who she is? Now we're looking at something truly magnificent. Now we're looking at something that is yet another blessing from our gods. Now all of a sudden the image of what we might become begins to become grand. Who is to say, who is to stop me from cultivating that? Why would I let anyone who read a book tell me that I can't do that? When you find yourself around people that say, well, you can't do that. You don't understand a heathen worldview. Who are you to say these kind of things? Who are you to say these kind of things? Who are you to say these kind of things? You're a full grown man, ain't you? You're the inheritor of a ancestral stock that goes back thousands of generations of couples that loved each other in some manner enough to bring new life into the world. A life that was blessed. Something we could fall back on, something we could believe in. Why should we doubt what we are, what we could become? We seem to struggle, we seem to wrestle with these demons of well they might say something about me or i've got this i've got this identity <clears throat> as odin wandered after he lost the throne of asgard and he pierced himself to the tree with his own spear to sacrifice himself to himself when he fell he didn't pick up a book he picked up the runes the keys to the very power of life universe <clears throat> the message that is the pattern of how we travel through this world. He got rid of himself. He built a new image by getting rid of that baggage that kept him from becoming something more. He literally pierced himself to the tree. When somebody walks through the world and something happens to them, they say they've been abused or they've had a broken heart or they got kicked as a child or their girlfriend didn't tell them they were man enough or the mother didn't help the boy become man enough or any kind of thing like that or even i've been to prison or i've suffered in combat and your whole thought process revolves around that how do you let go of that baggage to get rid of it so you can become something more when we consider that our identity i am somebody i am somebody special because i have suffered in this way <laughs> the predominant thought process of this victim culture that we live in encourages us to hang on to that. In this room full of people, I've not heard once say, I've been a victim. I've hurt because I'm somebody because. You don't find that in here. There are men and women in all of these rooms who have suffered things we can't begin to imagine. And yet they come in here to build an image of themselves. When we drive out of that driveway, we're all going to hate it. And then we'll see each other at that store down there as we buy a pop and get some gas and head on out. And everybody's going to be like, oh, wow, this is all right. This is cool shit. <laughs> That's the best part of it. You know, you meet somebody just like you that says, man, I'm taking a different path. I've pierced myself to the tree. When people can't let that stuff go and that flow of energy, that flow of it, when a tree grows, it gathers up all these nutrients and goes up the tree and then goes out the leaf and become something so radically different that the nutrients in the ground could, part, could hardly imagine what it means to become a gas. It's the same thing with us. We're moving through life with this flow of energy. We've got all this stuff going. We're moving forward to this. To, to we go, all of us are going to the same place, folks, no matter what. We're all going to get that doorway of death, and we're all going to have to contend with that sun-facing goddess. We're all going to have to walk through that door. We can't begin to imagine what that's going to be like. Who knows? It's something so radically different, our minds can't fathom it. Do we want to become a knot 
on the tree. Whenever you see a tree that gets a wound or an imperfection, it forms a big burl, it forms a knot, and all positive energy that comes out of the ground to go to the leaves stops right there. I saw a woman just before the holidays, she walked into Dollar General. Another lady behind recognized her. She didn't say, hi, hello, screw off, nothing. She said, my husband died just before Christmas. And she was immediately swamped with three other ladies. Oh, you poor thing. <laughs> Julian the Apostate pointed it out a thousand years ago. You have the hero that goes out in the world and strives to become something better, puts his best foot forward day after day, gets a slap in the face, gets a kick in the nuts, and keeps trying. Mm -hmm. And somebody comes out there that's sick. Well, I've got, you know, uh, I don't know what to do. I'm, I've got arthritis, and I'm kind of, and they'll get all the attention in the world. It's easy to do that. It's easy to do that with our thought process, too. When we can't build ourselves, when we can't control our, you know, it's our mind. If we can't control the thoughts that go through it, we're in pretty bad shape. When we're waiting on someone else to give us permission to think the right thoughts because we've read the right book, how do we cultivate that image that we want to become? What do we want to look like? So I ask all of you, when we leave here, Think about what you want to look like. Do I want to look like something special because I am special, because I am important, because I am a powerful man? Or do I want to be something because everyone else says, well, he's pretty cool. Which one is it? Because I can assure you, one will lead you to a powerful, healthy realization to be a king in your own home, to raise children that will walk this earth proud of who they are, where they come from, and never once have a second doubt about whether or not they can or cannot do something. And the other will have you constantly languishing, wringing your hands, wondering, does that person really like me? Nobody wants to live like that. And yes, we sacrificed the very best of who we are when our determine the quality of our spiritual being in here, we sacrifice a lot. Our attempts to reclaim it reside most powerfully in cultivating that image of who and what we want to become in these rooms right here. Give those compliments. Shake that hand. Love these people. Because this is our future. This is what we're going to become. Stand up for them and don't be afraid of the recriminations of what some jackass on Facebook says. Mm -hmm. All right? <laughs> yeah, I'm done. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I can. I can.